How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of DNA. Hello, you are listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. DNA Today informs you on what's happening in the genetic world. During my broadcast, I educate the public on genetic and public health topics through event coverage, news stories, book movie reviews, and my favorite interviews. Guests include genetic counselors, researchers, patient advocates, and professors in the field of genetics. Joining me today is Wesley Wilson. He's a Canadian molecular biologist whose work is studying on epigenetics of tumor progression in pediatric brain cancer. Very interesting. Wes is also an ardent programmer and developer sitting on one of the organizing committees for Hacking Health. Wes founded the online science blog, MostlyScience.com, and contributes to ScienceSeeker.org. Definitely check those out. We'll plug them at the end of the show as well. His writings aim to demystify evidence-based medicine. Thanks for coming on the show, Wes. Thanks for having me. Wow, when you say that bio that way, it sounds like I've done a lot. <laughs> I Definitely. Feel like I never do anything. You're, you're an important person to come on the show. You know, it's a very you big go. deal. You're a guest, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Definitely. So before we get into the complexities of epigenetics, or even kind of attempt to cover the complexity of epigenetics, can you break down what epigenetics is, like how it works? Sure. So epigenetics is the study of gene expression, and that is the changes of what genes are turned on or turned off or how much or how little they're expressed. So where genetics talks about the genes themselves, the mutations in the DNA, epigenetics is less about the changes in the cell because of the genes, but how the genes are turned on and how much of them. So, so it's kind of like if people can imagine like the genome as like a piano and epigenetics is what's actually being played. Exactly. So it's not an entirely a new concept in science as a whole. We've known for a long time that different cells have different things that are turned on. It's why a liver cell is a liver cell and a liver cell is not a kidney cell. They have the exact same genomic DNA, but they look, they look and they express much different genes to each other. So what do we know about the epigenetics of tumor progression in general compared to epigenetics of everything else that's happening? Well, we know quite a lot and at the same time, very little. <laughs> kind of seems to be a consensus uh, in science overall. We know a lot, but at the same time, we don't know that much. Exactly. So our understanding uh, of epigenetics and gene profiling in the last decade or so has really expanded. We've learned tons. We've learned about genes that are turned on and off as uh, tumors progress. Uh, so in my field of pediatric brain cancer, uh, low-grade gliomas becoming high-grade gliomas. We've seen uh, expression profiles that change when they progress forward. Um, looking at different subtypes, even in uh, medulloblastoma, uh, which is another brain tumor I work with, um, you can see types that show patterns for more aggressive growth, um, and even ones that show um, that might be more um, susceptible to chemotherapy agents. But at the same time, we have these huge data sets. I mean, know all these genes that are turned on and all these ones that are silenced, and it can be hard sometimes to determine if those genes are up-regulated or down-regulated because, you know, they're important for tumor survival because that's what causes a cancer cell to be cancerous. Or if because these tumor cells, their whole cell cycle, the whole regulation is messed up to begin with. That's how they become tumors. And these are just byproducts. These are side effects. So if you, like, up-regulate one gene because it got mutated or something, the, re the cell tries to compensate by, like, down-regulating something else. And the cause and effect can sometimes be hard to decipher. Are there certain genes that are very prominent in brain cancer as opposed to, say, liver cancers, you said before, or colon cancer? Sure. So one of the great things about some of these um, expression profiles is how much we're learning between the differences in these cancers. Um, there's definitely some crossover. So uh, there are tumor suppressor genes that you see across the board that are risk factors or diagnostic markers for different types of tumor progression or just tumor types in general. Um, P53 um, is, a, is a great example uh, of that, which is a popular tumor suppressor. But there's also lots of oncogenes and the upregulation and downregulation uh, of those. Um, Dicer is another common one. Um, specifically, all I mean, each tumor type is going to be different. So like kidney, liver, breast, uh, brain, there are going to be specific markers which are useful. Uh, and medulloblastoma, uh, which I work with, which is my primary tumor of focus, 
uh, there's two genes in particular. Um, one is Wnt, and one is SHH, which is Sonic Hedgehog protein. Uh, and these these are make up two of the four actual molecular subtypes is based purely on expression profile. So you're really looking at which genes are being affected and if they're oncogenes or tumor suppressors to say what subtype it is. Yes, exactly. So when we talk about oncogenes and tumor suppressors, for those that don't remember, if we kind of think of the cell as a car, we can think of the oncogenes as being like total lead foot, totally on the gas and just going. But whereas the tumor suppressor genes are kind of the brake, and if the brake doesn't work, then it kind of keeps going to try and understand this for people that may not be as <laughs> fluent in this as maybe we are. Right, right, exactly. So, yes, um, that's exactly right. Um, so the tumor suppressor genes um, are sometimes, um, they're, you know, they're involved in things like DNA repair. They're involved in things um, like apoptosis pathways for cell death. Um, and when these things can go awry, you can definitely get increased uh, chances of cancer development. So you touched on this a little bit, but how can we apply this knowledge of how epigenetics works in the different cancers to actually diagnose them? We've seen differences between them, but how are we actually diagnosing between these different types of cancers? So there's lots of types of mechanisms, uh, mechanisms I can, I can enunciate, um, <laughs> that are involved in changes in expression. You know, everything from transcription factors, enhance, like enhancer sites, um, the most common one, I mean, there's chromatin segregation. One of the ones thing most people are familiar with that you might read about is methylation. And DNA methylation, uh, if it's at a promoter region, can suppress a gene. And if it's in other regions, it can enhance the expression of a gene. And one way we can look at these profiles very quickly is uh, looking at the methylation sites on the DNA. And by looking at methylation profiles, we, we have been able to create various tools and diagnostics uh, criteria and chi little chip arrays uh, to help us diagnose subtypes of tumors. So how does the chip array work? Is it like a microarray or what is it? Methylation arrays are these tiny little chips where you can put samples of DNA and um, like the 450K array, for example, has hundreds of thousands of little marker spots on it that bind to and detect various methylation sites on uh, the human exome. So these are, we're looking at parts of the genome that code for proteins. And based on these, by looking at these areas, these profiles can come out. So if you have 400 of these things or 900 of these things, you start to see patterns in types of tumors. And there's a group in Germany that's done amazing work. And there's a group in Sweden that recently came out with a little software package, which makes it very accessible for someone like me. I can put it on my laptop, and I can put in the methylation data from a tumor that, let's say, I biopsied here, and it will tell me what type of pediatric brain tumor it is based purely on the methylation profile. So that methylation profile, is it similar to kind of having different colors, saying if there's a loss or gain of DNA there, or like, is it... I know that some microarrays have like the green, yellow, or red. Is it similar to that or sure. completely different? Uh, it's kind of completely different. Okay. Uh, so the, it's great that you bring up those red, green ones. Those are great. Um, those are talking about changes uh, usually compared to like a normal tissue or compared to something of genes that are turned up and turned down. Um, and you can kind of see, you know, red is down regulated and then green is up regulated. And that's usually, also usually micro uh, RNA um, arrays. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, so you're looking at RNA and you're looking at the expression, how much RNA is in the cell, which is, which we then equate to being how much protein is in the cell. That's, it's not a perfect approach. There are other things that can get in the way from turning RNA into a protein, especially if this, I don't know how much you know about micro RNA, but um, it is looking at a different aspect. The methylation profiles are looking at one step before. So we've stepped, we're taking one kind of step out from genomic, and we're looking at what could be changed in these expression profiles. So methylation definitely plays a huge role in expression. Um, what exact role, how every methylation works, is still unknown. We know a lot about changes in expression for methylation sites at histones, for example. 
Um, we know about enhancer regions. We know about promoter regions, silencing genes, but there's still a lot we don't know. How has diagnosing cancers changed in the last few years? We've obviously gained a lot of information about cancer and we're gaining even more, especially with the cancer moonshot happening. What methods are used in the lab today compared to previous years? Well, microscopy still plays a massive role in diagnosing tumors and cancer. Um, as much as like the epigenetic conferences would like you to believe, we're still a really long way from replacing pathologists with little machines where you can just inject a tumor sample and it spits out a diagnosis. But we have come a long way looking at proteins, genomic DNA, mRNA to help determine both the tumor types for diagnosis, but also the best treatment options. So it's really taking a look at multiple areas, like looking at the actual cells, looking at its genetic information and taking all of this information together to make a diagnosis. Exactly. And to both determine prognosis and treatment, which is key. Uh, our newest treatments are very, our new chemotherapy agents are very molecular based. And depending on what uh, genes are expressed and what pathways are upregulated, it changes how and what we use to target them. So depending on how the tumor is progressing, the treatment changes. So what, what's a couple examples of this, of different types of cancers and how fast they're going and how that treatment may change in a patient? Sure. So, I mean, it, it does depend on a couple factors, and that is the understanding that we have of the specific cancer. And there are some barriers built into our healthcare system because it's not a perfect system yet. Um, one is obviously the type of tumor. So if you have breast cam cancer is a great example because we have a targeted therapy called Herceptin. And if you look at the proteins when you, after you take the biopsy, and if these proteins are there, you will, not only is it to test fast enough to get this result back in time for the next consultation, but adding the drug to the treatment plan has a great impact on prognosis and outcome. But like the opposite to that is there are some cancers where, where we have the diagnostic tests from a molecular approach to determine a specific subtype and even determine prognosis, but no targeted therapies exist. So even if you had that information in time to start treatment, it wouldn't change your treatment plan at all. So it really depends what has been FDA approved because maybe it's something that's currently being developed, but a patient that has a certain type of cancer now wouldn't benefit from that drug. Right, right. And, and we may not just have a good target. So, I mean, there's a lot of cancers. We look at profiles, we look at markers, and we just haven't found anything we can hit yet. Um, I, I, there is the other side, which is kind of this healthcare conundrum of, you know, who has access to what technology. I mean, technology is growing and the access to it is increasing rapidly, but some of these diagnostic tools aren't available at every hospital. So one of the issues we have, especially um, with brain tumors, which you, where you need to start treatment very quickly, is that if you don't have these tools available to you, the only option would be to take a sample for the biopsy, ship it to a facility that it does, have them run the test, have them send you back the report. But by that time, you'd have already had to have started treatment anyway. And so there is sort of this kind of debate, and I've had discussions with uh, physicians at conferences, um, if they think it's even worth doing those tests, if it's not going to affect their treatment plan at all. So if a patient does have that sample sent out as they're still getting a treatment, but to kind of maybe zone in on what treatment would be the best, if that comes back, do physicians often change their treatment plan based on the results of that uh, tumor biopsy? Oh, for sure. I mean, if, if it comes back, I mean, there's so many cancers to talk about. So, I mean, I won't get into it, but the, obviously there's hundreds and hundreds of cancers. Um, for sure. If they got a sample back and it sh showed that it was, you know, completely resistant to one of the drugs they were using, they would stop that drug immediately, for example. Um, and obviously getting that data back for prognostic, um, data is really important too. Um, because just for the patient, the patients and the families want to know, you know, if, if it's a certain, if, you know, if it's as a generalized example, if it's a type A of some disease, let's say, and it has a worse outcome than type B, the family wants to know. Even if the treatment's identical no matter what, even if there are no selective treatments, they're still going to want to know that information. So is it often the case that someone can have, say they have that type A cancer, um, and two patients have type A cancer, is it seen that it can progress at different rates even when they have the same subtype of cancer? For sure. 
So the subtypes that we use in classifications are kind of these generalized ideas of how we can talk about them. Um, they're, they're either molecular markers or they're pathways that are upregulated, and it's very useful information. But these subtypes usually, you can, you can even subclassify them into subtypes of subtypes of subtypes of subtypes. So you could have you know, an SHH uh, medulloblastoma, but you could have one that has P53 mutated, one that has P53 uh, wild type. And the mutant type, for example, um, has a much, much higher risk. These, you know, uh, meanwhile, with the, the P53 wild types have very, very low risk prognosis. So, and they're both the same subtype of medulloblastoma. So you, as you go down to the different pathways to the different mutations, um, you can cha- it changes the aggressiveness of the cancer greatly. And as cancer progresses, oftentimes more mutations are acquired, whereas maybe at the beginning of the cancer there wasn't that many and it starts out with one mutation and it cascades from there. Do patients often have multiple tests to kind of keep track of this or is that a little too advanced for us right now? Anytime a pathway involved in DNA repair is affected, you're always going to see an accumulation of mutations as the T tumors grow and progress. And it's not common to re-subtype or re-biopsy uh, during treatment. But if there is a relapse or a reoccurring tumor, then it will be reassessed. And one of the interesting things you do see is that when these tumors come back, uh, sometimes years later, uh, they can be different subtypes of the original uh, tumor. It's really interesting. So you can have one type of tumor and maybe you've kind of, you know, beat it, as we say, but then it can kind of arise as a different subtype of the same overall cancer. Exactly. And there's many different possible reasons for that. Um, some tumors are very heterogeneous in nature, so they're, they're made up of lots of different types of tumor type. Like there's little changes and little, each cell is a little different. And sometimes a treatment may only be really effective against one type, let's say. And what has happened is the other type has just, you know, gone dormant and it was never really affected by the treatment to begin with. Um, and sometimes we have um, treatments that cause more DNA damage. I mean, radiation damage is, um, da- damages DNA. It's, it, literally, its function is to destroy DNA in the hopes of killing the cells. And if the cells come back from that, if they are able to repair their DNA, it's very possible they can accumulate more uh, mutations and more dysfunction. It's all about targeting the right cells there. If you are targeting the cancer cells, that's great, but you're going to end up having those off-target effects. Yep. So how do you see the future of pediatric brain cancer going? Where do you see maybe the next um, step in finding new treatments and cures? Is there kind of a hot area in pediatric brain cancer, or is it all kind of just rocketing in the future? Oh, it's there's a lot of rocketing. I see two huge avenues of advancement. One is going to be with these, with the new molecular data we have on these tumors. With all this, we've done all the sequencing, we know all of these genes, we're looking at the expression profiles, the epigenetic markers. We're going to look at a lot more targeted approaches, a lot more therapies that target specific pathways. Um, we're seeing a, a change. We won't know the real results of this for many years, but um, we've seen changes in proton therapy Uh, from photon therapy and radiation, which we hope to decrease the side effects of radiation therapy. Um, The United States is definitely uh, using that right now. It's not being used in Australia yet. Um, And I think another thing is changing the approach we take to clinical trials in children. Um, One of the big, big issues with testing new treatments is we rarely use anything or try anything on children if it wasn't effective in adults. And that is a, not a great approach because what can happen is you could have a compound that could work in pediatric tumors because these are different biologies. These aren't the same tumors. But if it fails an adult trial, it'll never, ever get tested in children. So we have all these therapies that are just not being used. And there's definitely groups around the world that are fighting to change this approach, letting us try first-round therapies in, in children clinical trials and pediatric clinical trials. And I think that's going to open the door to a lot of new therapies that were either hidden or lost in the past because as a society, we protect our children. We don't want to put them at risk, um, as well as moving new treatments forward faster. 
So what is the advantage of actually testing on um, children versus adults? Do children often have a very different response than adults because their DNA maybe isn't as uh, mature or as old or anything like that? Definitely. Um, there, there's, like, the side effects are different. Uh, the biology of the cancers are different. Children develop tumors and cancer for a lot of different reasons than adults do, as you can imagine. If you think that we're constantly accumulating DNA damage, children have less exposure. So their causes can sometimes, you know, when they can be caused by completely different things. Um, one example I will give is when I was in Toronto at SickKids Hospital, there was this drug that was uh, used for, uh, I think it was for glioblastoma. Um, and it was a telomerase inhibitor. For your listeners who don't know, telomerase is used for extending these telomeres at the end of chromosomes. So when you replicate, you lose a little bit of your DNA and because the replication process is in, imperfect, but you have these big chunks of DNA at the end of them that aren't used for anything, so it's okay. And telomerase keeps adding on that just sort of random repeats so that you don't lose good things. But when you get older, your telomerase stops working. And tumors use telomerase to keep their Im immortality. Because if you lose too much DNA after replicating too many times, you'll die. So the idea is you use a telomerase inhibitor as a drug, and you could maybe kill these cancer cells. For the longest time, this was not used in children because it was thought that children still had telomerase activity that was active in all their cells, and you know it could have too many side effects, and the unknowns were too big, and so we'd never use it in kids. And it was only recently that they trialed it in children after new work came out on stem cells in general, which showed that telomerase activity did not play as big of a role in stem cells in general as we had originally had thought. And this data allowed us to then say, oh, okay, we'll try it in kids. But these kind of things have, hold, have held up pediatric clinical trials for a long time. And it's just transforming healthcare from there of really taking things that maybe we've done in the past, but now applying it to be able to actually use it today. Exactly. So you're involved in a um, organization called the Hacking Health Organization, which, you know, it's transforming healthcare, and it's a little different approach. It's connecting healthcare professionals with entrepreneurs to strategize those solutions to solve healthcare problems. Can you kind of expand on this and share what health and ha uh, Hacking Health is currently working on and what your role is in this? Sure. So Hacking Health is awesome. This thing is pretty amazing. The basic premise back when it started many years ago in Montreal was to take frontline-facing healthcare professionals and pair them with engineers and developers who could build real-world solutions for the problems they're facing. They could take it back to them to hospitals and clinics and start you know, solving those problems, or you know, some of them became companies. Um, it was very, very interesting. Um, and then that, that was, like I said, that was many years ago. And in about 2012, I want to say, they moved out of Montreal and they were here in Toronto, and I attended one of their events as just a participant, and I was instantly hooked. I thought these were amazing. Love what they're doing. It's like the crossroad. Like you're, you know, you're inspiring innovation when you take two different disciplines and cross them. You know? So this was technology and healthcare. Loved it. And then uh, later in 2014, I ran and head up the Vancouver event for it and had a lot of fun there. And since then, I've expanded and helped run other cities such as Winnipeg and Toronto again in 2015. And you know, the organization has just grown so much. It's in so many countries now, uh, France, China, Australia, United States. Um, they've grown, their focus has grown, their missions have grown. They've definitely taken on more of entrepreneurship with more of a startup festival style instead of the original hackathon style. Um, they recently opened up their first um, health tech innovation accelerator uh, in Montreal for Canadian digital health. Uh, I'm not involved in any of that stuff. That's all Luke and uh, his little uh, his little baby. But it's been many, many years in the planning and to get funding for that. So they're very, very excited about that. Um, you know, lots of people bring a lot of unique skills to those things to make you know to make the events work. You know, we have volunteers like marketing people, event planning people. You couldn't put on the massive events we do at some of these convention centers without them. Um, you know, I was attracted to it less from that perspective and more because it met where my two passions meet, you know, healthcare and technology. So like, all my academic training has always been in medical and health sciences, but, you know, I'm an avid developer, I'm hobbyist, tinkerer, and hacker, and it just was a really good fit for me. It sounds like an awesome organization that's just really propelling into the future, and I love how they're taking those two mindsets of people that are more entrepreneur-bound and have experience in that, and then people that have a lot of expertise in healthcare. It's a really good merging. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, and that's where we're going to see change, and especially for patients' uh, perspective. You know, we always see a lot of uh, bench top science, and it's hard for it to reach the bedside. But there's so many little innovations that have already happened in other sectors, and just migrating that technology over to healthcare can improve patients. And having just the communication side of things that sometimes people that are really involved in research aren't as skilled at communicating their research to the public. So there's always, you know, people like you said, marketing and all of that, that help actually kind of be that uh, translator between, you know, the really hard, dense science to kind of watering it down to layman's terms. Oh, for sure. I mean, I think that's a big push a lot of academic institutions are doing. Uh, You know, they're getting their researchers on Twitter and they have science-related blogs uh, connected to their universities and institutes. And, uh, you know, science communication of science is becoming, it, it's the next frontier right now for us. Definitely. Yeah, it's a, it's a good career to uh, get into, certainly. <laughs> well, that about wraps up today's episode of DNA Today. Thank you so much, Wes, for giving us insight into epigenetics and pediatric cancer and the Health and Hack organizations. For me, it's great to learn about these things, and I'm sure listeners feel very similarly. Thanks for having me. It was, it was fun. Definitely. So you can check out Wes's two blogs at MostlyScience.com and also ScienceSeeker.org. He's over on Twitter at Wesley Wilson. I'm over on Twitter at DNA Podcasts. And everything related to the show is at DNAPodcast.com. Any questions you have for me, more likely Wes, for this episode, you can email in at info at DNAPodcast.com. I'll be sure to pass all that along to him. And thanks again for coming on. It's really been a fun episode and just to learn so much. Thanks for having me. It was a fun little adventure. Thanks for listening and join me next week to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made.